I would like to introduce to you our next speaker. Makiba Foster is the Director of Libraries for the College of Worcester in Worcester, Ohio. Throughout her career, Makiba has increasingly invested her energies into helping libraries reimagine services to better serve and positively impact her community. Her work includes libraries as incubators for the arts with the creation of a social justice artist residency, faculty and community collaborations focusing on the role of libraries and archives in advancing social justice through digital archives like Documenting Ferguson and co-creating the historic web archiving project, Archiving the Black Web. So may I please invite to the stage, Makiba Foster, give her a warm welcome. Good afternoon. I just want to shout out the producers and the tech folks because I feel like I actually could have asked for some walkout music and it would have been okay. They've been playing really good music in Theater One, so good job. Good job. So um, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Um, this is my second IIPC. I had the first opportunity back in 2018. Um, to attend this conference in New Zealand, and it's always been um, really illuminating um, uh, sitting in on some of the sort of techie parts of it, but this might be a little bit of the softer side of web archiving, talking about um, what we do in terms of our practices and who we recruit to web archiving and the kind of collections we're, we're hoping to build. So I am Akiba Foster. I serve as the principal investigator and project director for Archiving the Black Web, um, also known as ATPW, along with my co-creator, Burgess Jules, who's better known for his work on documenting the now, also known as DocNow, um, which is an important project that created a tool and, and conversations in terms of ethical practices around archiving social media. So in 2019, um, with the purpose of starting a national dialogue and building an inclusive community for black knowledge, memory workers, and information collecting and pr preservation practitioners whose work has shown a commitment to the mission and documentation of black life, we wanted to create some space and accessibility within web archiving to have these conversations specifically targeted at these folks. So with the increasingly digital times that we live in, Archiving the Black Web is working to be intentional about diversifying web archiving to create opportunities for black collecting institutions, organizations to actively participate in web archiving digitally born content of both historical significance and everyday lived experiences of people of the uh, African diaspora. So the partners on this endeavor include public research libraries, community-based archives, and historically black colleges and universities, libraries, and archives. So for our discussion today of archiving the black web, um, this is um, a, a talk about our intervention towards more inclusive representation and practices um, within web archiving. So I want to just do a quick overview of what I'll be talking about, specifically our um, vision for the work of archiving the black web. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about, share more about why and how we started this project, um, and particularly the details of the project supported by our funders, um, specifically looking at um, how we started the project as an exploratory fact-finding sort of mission, um, which was supported by funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Um, and now our current phase of this particular project, um, which is to take those findings and put them into practice, um, which is supported by our work with Mellon, and then talk a little bit about the future plans for archiving the Black Web. So archiving the Black Web's mission is to develop a collaborative strategy focused on research, funding, training, collection development, and public engagement to guide the archiving practices for web content about black people. We seek to contribute viable and equitable solutions to increase available collections of the black web, uh, black web content by uh, training black memory workers to produce web archive collections and by supporting black collecting institutions to formally create sustainable web archiving programs. 
So in addition to uh, the training and the creation of a, a sort of black web um, collections, and I've been really um, interested in, in hearing more about some like the, the WorkNet and some other collaborative work that has happened around web archiving. Um, in terms of our work of creating uh, uh, black web collections and collectives and programs, our aim is also to support the burgeoning and involving field of scholarship that explores black people's participation on the web and their creation of digital communities, particularly because when we talk about black people in the digital space, often we talk about them from a deficit um, in terms of the digital divide. And in a lot of ways, that conversation overshadows actual black participation that has been on the web. And so we want to actually start to read against sort of those narratives um, with working with scholars to really figure out what has black participation been? No, there has not been a lot of, of the digital divide is real, but then there also have been people in those spaces and how have we silenced those folks in those spaces? But one of the really important things about archiving the black web is that whenever we share the mission of archiving the black web, the people and the organizations that we hope to impact and support with this work, they immediately understand why this issue is critical and they want to participate because they have been left out of some of these conversations. So now I wanna really talk about, about our mission and how it came to be and the, the questions that sort of drive our work. So um, in terms of the origin and catalyst of archiving the black web. So some of the things that sort of uh, really critically help us to sort of interrogate practices and our thinking and um, is that we want to constantly ask ourselves some questions within the practice of web archiving. Particularly, who gets to web archive? Um, and that question for us is sort of like, foundational um, because we're actually trying to create pathways and access to um, opening up this field to other folks who have been committed to this sort of work of documenting communities and cultural um, um, and society. But um, with this, this next phase of who we are as a world in terms of the digital space, they are woefully being left behind and can't do the work that they've committed themselves to do because um, they don't have access to this type of practice. So who gets the web archive? Types of institutions. So from what we can see uh, just from here, I mean, we understand that it's led mainly by private organizations, national libraries, and resource-rich universities. And I mean, we can simply look at the, the membership of IAPC and it gives an indica indication also in terms of types of institutions of who gets the web archive. And so archiving the black web started as an urgent call to establish more equitable and accessible web archiving practices to better document and preserve the black experience online. And so ATBW works, um, our work is to, to, to figure out ways to balance out some of these inequities in web archiving with uh, a focus on cre increasing black web archive collections and closing skill and knowledge gaps that have persisted despite almost 30 years of, of web archiving as a subfield. And I understand that this, this field is still growing and changing and things like that, but after this amount of time, we, we also, to make this practice better, we have to think about more inclusive practices. And so also, um, who gets to web archive or who gets to participate in this practice? The recruitment of practitioners. Um, it would be, you know, it's, this is not something that's being taught in library schools. So the question becomes, like, how do people come to web archiving? Um, from our own research, um, particularly looking at black collecting institutions, in the U.S., there are no formal web archiving um, programs established at any of the 102 historically black colleges and universities, to our knowledge nor any collecting institutions that represent public libraries, uh, museums, or community-based archives in the United States, with the exception of two of the, the libraries that we are working with on this project, Schomburg Center and the Auburn Avenue Research Library for African American Culture. And so um, these projects um, are, are important, but those two that I mentioned, they're actually beneficiaries of a really important um, intervention that was created by the Internet Archive, which is Community Webs. And so Internet Archive's Community Webs was a critical 
um, part of my being able to access um, and learn about the practice of, of web archiving. Um, it's a, it's a, the community webs works as a way of diversifying who gets to and, and what gets web archived. However, being a participant of that program, um, I know that it focused more on sort of local history of public libraries and public library and related. Um, and I want to acknowledge that this program is how I was giving access to this practice. However, it was while participating in this project that I realized that there was an opportunity to create additional pathways to web archiving for black history and cultural content, as well as providing more opportunities to diversify the practice with intentional opportunities, not only for more inclusive collections, but specifically to diversify representation of its practitioners. And so you'll hear more about community webs from my co-panelist, Zakia, and her work um, with, with this project with the Schomburg Center and how that evolved as well. The other part of our origin story is um, really thinking about what gets a web archive. And so we think about what the expansive um, growth of Black-centered digital spaces and practices. There is an opportunity to build new kinds of collections where we collaboratively build web archive collections sourced from content within Black digital communities. So the intent of this collaboration is to counter the insufficient and sometimes harmful collecting of Black web content done by organizations with extractive intentions instead of ethical collecting. And so the other part of, of, our, of the, the kind of process that we go through in terms of trying to do good work, ethical work, is also thinking about what is the Black web um, and who are the drivers of digitally born content um, and as we explore this growing area of research and scholarship, um, we recognize that um, the web has become a critical site of research for historians and other cultural scholars. And as black participation in the internet economy has grown over the past 25 years, people studying the black experience um, have increasingly turned to the web and social media to produce work documenting black history and culture. So despite this growth, um, the study of the, the Black experience online and the, fluent, and the influence of Black people on the development of the web, um, black, black collecting institutions and other archives that focus on documenting Black history for various reasons have found themselves outside of this practice and do not participate in building research collections of Black web content. And our hope is that we can actually start to create some pipelines to, to change this. So as ATBW works towards answering uh, these questions and fulfilling our mission, we set out to create a national dialogue to address the practices, the tools, scholarship, disparities, and opportunities for more equity and inclusivity in web archiving. So in 2020, we were fortunate to receive funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services with a national leadership grant to map the landscape, define the issues, and plan a strategy for documenting the Black experience online. And so through the support of IMLS, um, ATBW, to our knowledge, was the first attempt to define a comprehensive and thoughtful strategy to web archive in the digital online Black experience. So our strategy was informed by um, Black content creators, scholars who have been researching this issue, archivists who, whose work is compelled by a mandate to document the Black experience, and cultural memory advocates and community-based practitioners who have committed their work to creating more inclusive shared, a more inclusive shared uh, historical record. And so particularly in this exploratory phase, we wanted to better understand and explore a couple things, um, barriers related to training. So how do practitioners acquire and access this skill? Is it in library school? Is it through on-job training? Like who gets to do this? Um, and, and so also thinking about uh, the tools, uh, what are the tools that are available to some of these community-based archives and other folks that are, are under-resourced um, that these tools aren't cost prohibitive and also accessible um, to, to folks who might be starting a program from the ground up. So looking at things ethically, how do we create a collaborative or cultural competence 
and how do we create a collaborative of cultural competence and ethical accountability within web archiving? And, and finally, some of the things that we were trying to investigate with the strategic plan was um, the best practices for web archiving, putting all these things into practice. And so how we, we tried to execute on, on this sort of exploratory plan was through our deliverables. And so we were able to create um, a couple things, um, a survey and analysis of black collecting institutions, web archiving practices, uh, we did, uh, we created a national, we produced two national forums and a workshop and um, completed a, from our findings a white paper. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those deliverables. So building on the environmental scan that sort of got our work moving forward, um, we engaged various black knowledge collecting organizations um, and the environmental scan that we sent out in fall 2020 survey uh, black collecting institutions about their web archiving activities. Um, this survey included um, respondents from HBCU libraries and archives, public libraries, and other black cultural heritage institutions. And we asked questions such as, if your organization has a collection development policy, does it address collecting archival materials from the web? What is your skill level or understanding of web archiving? What are some of the barriers to your organization starting a web archiving program? Briefly share your thoughts on web archiving and its impact related to your organization's mission. And so folks answered those questions and for the most part, the majority of respondents um, confirmed what we, we, we believed and already sort of knew in that the uh, data emerged verified that most of the respondents' organizations did not have web archiving as part of their collection development practice. But I, I will and I, I will say it wasn't a part of, but there was a desire. So how do we eliminate some of those barriers to keeping folks that's keeping people from starting to do this process, this work that they want to do, but they have not been able to engage in? And so inviting the same survey respondents along with an open in invitation to anyone interested in the topic, we hosted our first national forum to highlight web archiving as a critical practice when documenting the black experience. So originally this was to be in person, but due to the pandemic, I think that's a lot of folks say that same thing, due to the pandemic, but due to the pandemic, uh, we hosted the two day national forum via Zoom in April of 2021. And so um, the sort of silver lining of, of, if you can find one from the pandemic, was that it created an even more accessible experience. The forum was supposed to be in person with limited people to be able to participate. But when we put it in the, the uh, virtual, um, as a virtual experience, um, the forum exceeded our expectations. Um, we hosted panel sessions with leading scholars and archival practitioners providing historical and contemporary context for better understanding black people's web and online participation. And so for day one, we had over 772 participants. And on uh, day two, the interest generated from day one, we had an increase of about 30%. So we had no idea that this would be as impactful or well attended um, as, it, it, as it was. And so although these were marketed as national forums, we had attendees participate from all over the world. And just so you know, if, if you would like to, these sessions were recorded and they are available on our website and hosted on ATBW's YouTube account. So one of the things when we debriefed um, related to our first forum, um, and trying to really analyze what we did well and what could be better, we realized that the pandemic as a major disruption to all of our lives, um, it interestingly also reinforced why ATBW uh, was so timely. Um, the practice of self-isolating during the pandemic made the digital um, made the digital space even more critical as a space for community and a site for cultural production. And so for ATBW, we believe that the digital content from the past few years has so much historical significance and that significance and that by way of web archiving just a, a fraction of the black lived experience through a deadly world health crisis 
as well as uh, sustain human rights violations against the sanctity of black life. During pandemic, we had Breonna Taylor, we had Ahmaud Arbery, uh, we had George Floyd. And so all of these things happen, happening simultaneously, we understand that even just to try to, to web archive a fraction of that, it, it would be important for our future research and future understanding, but also critical to adding to the historical record. And so the other part of, of some of our offerings to um, the public to build awareness about archiving the back black web was that we completed a two-day web archiving workshop that had a diverse mix of community-based organizations, librarians, archivists, and black collecting institutions, and black memory workers um, who happened to work also at PWIs who, was wanting also, who were wanting to learn more about web archiving. And so the workshop provided a sort of crash course on the history and the evolution of web archiving and then gave participants an opportunity to try out new open source web archiving tools led by the creators of uh, programs such as DocNow app as well as Web Recorder. And so trying to sort of simulate a classroom environment, we capped our registration at 30 where we had 23 registered participants for each day of the workshop, and we designed workshops specifically for the registered participants' knowledge base, um, where we had pre and post workshop surveys, which guided the content for both days. And so this workshop also attracted black memory workers and institutions outside of the US. And so for our final deliverable of the IMLS grant, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so that the, the end of phase one, um, we hosted our closing forum, and this was in, 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 in person, um, in New Orleans at Shift Collective's headquarters in May of 2022. So this time last year, we were in New Orleans. So this meeting was a follow-up to the first two-day national forum hosted in 2021. And the meeting brought together several collaborators to New Orleans for two days of highly engaged discussions and um, design sessions. The goal of this forum um, was to begin discussions around developing a collaborative strategy and addressing research, funding, collection development, and public engagement to help guide archiving practice around web content about Black people, and also um, to begin defining some goals, purpose, and function, functional aspects of uh, building a Black Web Archives collective. And so throughout these, these three events that I've mentioned um, during uh, the first phase of this project, Funding and research consistently came up as key issues that needed more focus and attention. And so while practitioners will always be the ones to sort of kick off this work, the funders and the well-resourced collecting institutions will also have to um, play a sort of key role in help growing the practice of web archiving beyond its current borders um, to be more inclusive of the Black experience and more accessible to Black people and their communities. So taking what we learned from um, phase one, uh, we were able to build out our project from moving for, from a exploratory kind of fact-finding mission to taking some of those ideas and putting them into practice. And so Archiving the Black Web was recently awarded a $2.5 million three-year grant from the Mellon Foundation to address training and scholarship gaps that currently hinder the collection of web content about black people and how that content can inform our understanding of addressing uh, of, of black life and culture. The, the other part of this is that the, the parallel pursuit that we are engaging in of both training and research um, is that we are looking to better understand um, uh, how, how uh, sort of the inaction on these issues um, has impacted us, but also really focusing on thinking about um, the, 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 the ways in which uh, we be need to better understand Black participation in the web space. And so some of the goals and deliverables um, from this phase of the grant is that we are excited to develop a continuing education training program in web archiving that is aimed at memory workers collecting archival content about black life, history, and culture. And this will launch next year with training opportunities throughout the year and culminating with an intensive week-long training in 2025. 
in addition to uh, the project, uh, we'll undertake the research initiatives that I sort of mentioned um, with the goals of mapping, describing, and producing scholarship about the Black web. Um, and then also, um, we hope to um, support uh, support Black collecting organizations and build capacity with microgrant opportunities as seed money to start um, web archiving programs at their institutions. And so ultimately, our goal with this phase of ATBW is to diversify and increase the number of web archiving pr practitioners and the collections that focus on the Black experience as well as bring scholars and archivists who want to increase understanding collections and scholarship about black people's use of digital communication technologies. And so as for our partners, um, our partners um, within this uh, collective include the diverse mix of folks that we think are important to bring to the table, um, including the, the renowned scholar, Dr. Meredith Clark, who leads the um, Center for Communication and Media Innovation and Social Change. She's done a lot of work around Black Twitter and other social media technologies and understanding uh, Black folks' participation in that space. Um, Youssef Amawale um, from the Southern California Library. He's, he's representing community-based archives, Derek Mosley, um, public research libraries focused on uh, collecting black content, and Holly Smith representing our HBCU um, component of this grant um, and her work at Spelman College Archives. And so with that, I'll leave you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we can answer those at the end. Um, but these are some of the ways in which you can find uh, the, the uh, YouTube videos and a couple other things uh, related to archiving the Black Web. Thank you for your time. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, let me make sure it's showing up properly. Okay. All right. So my name is Zakia Collier. I am the community manager for Documenting the Now, also known as Doc Now. But I am also the former digital archivist at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Um, that is a part of the New York Public Library in Harlem. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a project that um, I actually worked on there at the Schomburg that is representative of the work that... Um, we could be doing and that uh, archiving the black web is pushing for to sort of combine um, first to have uh, black collecting institutions to be participating in web archiving, um, but then also finding creative ways to both to integrate those web archives into their larger collections. And so with that, I will get started. So I always like to start uh, or include uh, citations in um, presentations to sort of ground um, and speak to a perspective that I am coming from. And so this is just a quote from um, an artist and a researcher, Mimi uh, Onawua, um, who looks at, um, who has this like beautiful exhibition called The Library of Missing Data Sets um, and really thinks about what is not included. What are the many, many data sets that simply do not exist because someone didn't think to create them? And that applies to web archiving, that applies to archiving in general. Um, so many things are missing because people are not thinking to include them. And so this quote reads, to collect, record, and archive aspects of the world is an intentional aspect Act, one that typically benefits those who have the power to decide what should be collected. Um, pretty straightforward, but, uh, you know, sort of bears uh, uh, reading and citing because um, a lot of things are not included in the archive simply because the people in power in various sorts of ways um, and various sorts of power is held didn't decided that that wasn't worthy of collecting or documenting, um, and so people are left out of the record. So uh, again, back to the Schomburg Center. So the Schomburg Center um, is the largest research center for the study of Black diasporic life, um, holding over a million physical items, including uh, manuscripts, books, rare books, um, periodicals, art artifacts, um, 
recorded materials, et cetera. Um, and this particular project, um, the sh hashtag Schomburg syllabus, and implementing web archiving at the Schomburg um, is a practice of sort of extending the work that has already been being done at the Schomburg for now over a, a going on um, a century. Um, the centennial for the Schomburg Center will be in 2025, um, which is unbelievable that that's the time period that we're in. But um, uh, here um, I have here on the slide is just um, an image from the uh, clipping files that are held at the Schomburg Center. And so sort of beginning in the 1920s, uh, librarians and staff and volunteers at the Schomburg Center uh, were collecting clippings, which is something that we may see in, in grandmother's closets. They're, they're sort of getting these clippings of everything that their grandbaby does that's great, um, and it's in the newspaper, and someone won an award. Um, but that work was also being done at the Schomburg Center to make sure that particular histories were not being forgotten. And sometimes it was just you know, a simple one part of a large publication, but wanting to make sure that that history is preserved. And so moving into sort of the web archiving, um, the, uh, the practice of web archiving at the Schomburg Center sort of is an extension of that work in sort of grabbing these clippings of black life and black accomplishments and creations online and web archiving them. Um, and so this is sort of a extension of um, black self-education, black self-preservation work um, through the ages with different technologies. So, you all know this wonderful woman here. You just, just met her not too long ago. Um, so, the uh, web archiving at the Schomburg Center, as Makiba mentioned, um, was accessible through the Community Web's program, granting program um, from the Internet Archive. And so, what uh, community webs enabled was the opportunity to have access to web archiving tools and training, um, and specifically for public library programs. And so the Schomburg Center being part of the New York Public Library makes it a public library, albeit a research library. And so what Makiba was able to do was sort of take the collecting that she was already doing um, and, and just keeping track of different trends um, online that black folks are doing, being sure to keep track of those links. But it gave her access to using um, the Internet Archives tool, Archive It, um, in order to actually preserve these ephemeral materials um, that could soon disappear. And so through uh, that grant, Makiba actually created a couple of collections um, that really not only sort of think about the local, which is what the Community Web Grants uh, grant was really uh, designed to do, was uh, positioning public libraries to really think about um, what they are, are sort of uniquely positioned to do by being you know, the local, local um, centerpiece of communities. They know what's going on. They know what the communities are experiencing, um, what type of organizing is happening, who's using the spaces in the library, what stories need to be told. Um, but thinking about the um, Schomburg Center specifically is that it's a, it's, like I mentioned, a research library, um, but also it is local, it's in Harlem, so thinking about Harlem itself, but it's also documenting an international community. And so uh, the responsibility, even in web archiving, is also to extend that to a much larger audience. And so we have collections on black politicians, um, the Schomburg's uh, sort of... Uh, um, websites that are sort of being retired, making sure to preserve those um, since the technologies may not work. As we all know, Flash no longer exists. So thinking about how many projects were made with Flash and how exciting that was in 2001, and it's no longer exciting anymore. Um, so wanting to make sure we're preserving those things as well. Um, black collecting initiatives, um, Harlem blogs, and so seeing blogs as a unique site, um, especially in documenting black history of where people are able to share their most intimate thoughts um, about themselves, their communities, um, and then have that publicly um, 
And then lastly, the hashtag syllabus collection, which you may have already guessed, probably has something to do with the hashtag Schomburg syllabus. So taking things back a bit um, to 2014, um, 2014 is uh, when we sort of had the Ferguson uprisings um, following the uh, murder of Michael Brown um, by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. And um, with those uprisings, we have a couple of things that sort of result from that moment, documenting the now being one of them uh, due to the fearless organizing of organizers, archivists, librarians, software developers, um, and community members to really think about documenting social media content. But then we also have... Um, the development of something called hashtag syllabi. So Professor Marcia Chatlin, who's at Georgetown University, um, decided to create a syllabus, um, crowdsource a syllabus using Twitter to sort of come up with resources that would help educators to talk about what was going on in Ferguson. Because as Ferguson, um, as, you know, so the events sort of begin around the beginning of August, um, but students are beginning to go back to school. They're seeing these things on the news and are needing to have context for this. And so it's kind of funny to see this kind of considering the way that um, things have changed almost 10 years later with sort of many of the resources included on these syllabi being banned in different states and in different educational institutions in the US. However, um, you know, at this moment in time, um, information was freely available. Um, and hopefully we will return to that at some point. Um, but um, this, uh, this one syllabus sort of kicked off a trend of creating digital syllabi on, on sort of beginning on Twitter, later moving to Google Docs and po possibly to a stable website um, to really make sure that people are able to contextualize social justice movements and events that are that are happening around them. And it later expanded to other types of syllabi. So not just about injustices, but about popular culture. There's syllabi about Beyonce and about theater and about uh, comics and Afrofuturism and so on and so forth. And so, but what this particular, this was sort of a, um, an innovation in education to have people crowdsourcing material to say, I think this is particularly helpful in understanding this movement. And I think this would be great for students or this might be great for college students or community members. Um, and sort of um, democratizing the playing field with not requiring people to state their degrees or anything to say, I'm recommending this resource and I have 10 PhDs. Um, nobody should get to 10 PhDs, but... Um, 10 PhDs uh, is sort of anyone who comes across this thread on Twitter or comes across this Google Doc is able to contribute um, and it later turn into a larger resource, may become published, may be mentioned in a news article. And so Makiba had the foresight to really recognize uh, these syllabi as something worth preserving um, and also recognizing them as a part of the long uh, sort of legacy of self-education practices in marginalized communities who, at, at many communities at some point, were not allowed to use libraries, were not allowed into educational institutions. And so they created reading groups, they created study circles, um, and historical groups to really learn their own histories. Um, and this is sort of a uh, modern day version of that. However, many of these syllabi are very ephemeral. Um, as we can think about with uh, any collaborative project, there's a lot of people who have different stakes, different levels of commitment, um, you know, we, the time period changes, people aren't maybe thinking about that anymore. Someone has it on their Squarespace or web hosting account, and then they forget about it. They don't pay the fee. They get a new credit card. All types of things happen, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, even with projects within one institution. So think about it when there's multiple people involved who maybe have never met in person, who don't know each other outside of this one collaboration it creates a special level of ephemerality. Um, and then many of these materials are 
also um, controversial in that they are contextualizing um, you know, things that are being contested, like police brutality, um, like uh, environmental racism. And so we have uh, the possibility of these materials being removed offline. And so recognizing this importance, um, Akiba began keeping track of and then later web archiving these syllabi. And so this is just a, another example of one um, related to um, violence in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, I believe. And so fast forward, that's me, um, different hair, um, but that's me. Um, so the fast forward to the Schomburg Syllabus Project, um, which is sort of the um, next generation of the uh, sort of web archiving that Makiba was doing at the Schomburg Center. So the Schomburg Syllabus Project um, sort of continues that web archiving, um, formalizes it, and uh, it was uh, generously funded by the Mellon Foundation as well um, to sort of, in thinking about how the, uh, other black collecting institutions have not had the ability to have training, to um, have access to these tools, um, this particular project um, allowed me to sort of come up with policies and collection development and permissions policies and a workflow for web archiving at the Schomburg Center, building on um, the work that Makiba had already done, but then also taking those web archives and finding a way to integrate them within the Schomburg's collections. And then also, in a like sort of meta sense, um, as you know with grants, there's like so many things going on in one grant. In a meta sense, also creating the Schomburg's own syllabus um, that can uh, sort of be an intro point into the 11 million items, 11 million plus items. Do we have a real number? <laughs> Not sure. But 11 million plus will, will be the number until, you know, we maybe get to like 12 million plus. Um, but 11 million plus items, so like an intro point into those, but also um, teaching our, like the Schomburg's communities um, and researchers and uh, sort of pointing them to web archives as an avenue and as a, as a resource that they can either partake in themselves or benefit from um, as they're doing research because the history of the present will very much so be a history of the internet um, as pretty much everything that we're doing is online. I'm still favorable to paper, but you know, also a digital archivist, so you know, either way goes. But this project um, sort of gathered black authored um, and black created or, uh, or about black people uh, documents online um, to really celebrate this overall um, history of self-education, but then also to um, really highlight um, what web archiving can look like in a black collecting institution. I think I skipped a couple slides. Okay, so workflow. Um, two year project and um, it was more or less me um, and with the wonderful, uh, my wonderful colleagues at the Schomburg Center, but developing policy, um, continuing web archiving throughout the length of the project. Um, gratefully, the Community Webs program um, provides, uh, continue to provide data through Archive-It even after the end of the grant period, um, which allowed us to continue um, web archiving um, without necessarily uh, having to create a, a budget for the data that would be provided through web um, Archive-It. Um, so it also included sort of designing the final product um, during this time, looking at the timeline, as you can see that, that the COVID happened at some point. Um, and so also wanting to um, have a proof of concept of the, the value and importance of having a web archiving program, meaning that not only can you sort of document things that are particularly ephemeral, but also particularly timely, um, as we all know, um, but wanting to sort of do that by archiving sort of the black experience of COVID-19. 
And so my best friend was this wonderful program called Airtable. Um, I love Airtable. I am an Airtable evangelist. They do not pay me anything, but if anyone knows them, tell them that they can pay me. I take all forms of payment. Um, but Airtable was sort of uh, how I managed the workflow, both the web archiving itself, um, sort of going through from accessioning and acquisition, sort of mirroring um, physical web archiving terms all the way to managing the project itself and curating um, the 135 items that made it into the final syllabus. Some of the considerations that I had in web archiving were intentionality. Um, so really thinking about, even though we have the capability to web archive, doesn't mean we need to web archive the whole internet because it does actually go somewhere. Server farms are real places that take up real land. Um, and also um, in having so much uh, content that's more to manage, more to think about, um, and more opportunities to cause potential harm, especially when you're thinking about marginalized communities, if you don't actually even know what's in all of the content. Um, and so a lot of times that involves moving quite slowly and not web archiving as much as I possibly could have, especially in thinking about um, content related to COVID and um, the uprisings of the summer of 2020. Um, and so, yeah, lots of slow work um, to really take a look at who's pictured in these photos and did they consent to being pictured? Do they also have words accompanying their pictures or did they get, you know, captured at a protest in a picture and like maybe don't want to be there or could later be prosecuted because they are photographed there and maybe, you know, the original publication takes it down, but then, you know, officials find it in the Schomburg's web archives and then I'm, I did it, you know? And so wanting to be intentional in that way thinking about collecting things that could be used for legal um, accountability at some point. So people who are seeking justice may be able to use these um, collections. So wanting to be intentional and gathering content for that. Remembering that people do have the right to be remembered and forgotten. And so wanting to be sure to add a permissions process um, where people can opt out to not being included because just because I think it should be kept for forever not the creator may not feel that same way um, and then also collective efforts and so even how I curated these collections um, me doing the work um, also involved having many conversations with people about what should I be collecting what should the collections look like um, what would you do and you know for this collection um, because even though it's about the black experience I am just one black person with multiple black experiences, but there are so many, many others. Um, and so wanting to make sure to include those as well. Um, so that included um, adding a few new collections that you see there, um, but the main focus being on the Schomburg syllabus or the hashtag syllabus collection, which has 322 sites or seeds um, and the COVID-19 collection with 357 sites or seeds. Um, and total there's about 1,200 um, that I was managing throughout all these collections. And here are just a few other syllabi that were web archived. Here is one particularly um, relevant to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, um, a consortium of black doctors that um, was started in Philadelphia, articles. Um, and so in collecting about COVID-19, I wanted to think about different perspectives. So the perspectives of religious institutions, Black uh, political officials, how were restaurants and businesses doing, um, especially in New York City. Um, and so, you know, here is an example of what was organizing look, looking like. And so some organizing included creating documents of these are all the black restaurants you should support because they're closing down, you know, as the days go on. So support them. Here's, you know, if they have a Venmo or some other payment platform, here's how you can support them monetarily if you're not going to purchase food from them. Um, and so wanting to make sure to document um, all of these efforts. Um, and then, okay, so here's the Schomburg syllabus. Um, 
which includes, like I mentioned, brings together digital collections, physical collections, as well as the syllabi organized into 27 themes, um, 135 items in recognition of Schomburg being on 135th Street um, in Harlem. Um, so 90 resources, 45 syllabi. Um, I didn't really plan for it to be like half like that, but it worked out. Um, there are also blog posts, live stream videos, really wanting to bring together a lot of things related to activism, educational activism, self-education, et cetera. Here's what it looks like once you click into one of the themes. Um, this one being whoops, politicians and elections with a relevant photo there. Um, blog posts highlighting things that are in the physical collections. Some live stream videos, again, related to educational organizing. And then that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for your presentations. Uh, we're a bit pressed for time, but I think if there's a question from the audience, we can take a question. So, please, is there, is there anyone who has a question for one of our speakers? Yes. Uh, I'll just walk with the microphone. Thank you both so much for all your work. These were amazing presentations. I have a question for Makiba. Um, the environmental survey that you did, you mentioned that it sort of confirmed what you already knew, which is that there wasn't a lot of black or a lot of web archiving as collections practices. I was wondering if there was anything that surprised you from the survey, or if it didn't surprise you, might surprise people in this room from some of the questions you asked. Nothing particularly surprising, but um, I think what we came away from um, looking at the respondents. Um, comments was there is an urgency they feel like they are not continuing the mission so most of them work at places whose mission is to collect preserve document the black experience and because they are not within the digital space doing that kind of work and they come from a tradition of that you heard Zakia make the connection of clipping files to web archiving to the present and so they feel the urgency um, of not being in this space. And we also feel that urgency because we're trying to create opportunities for them to get the training. And then also, these are under-resourced organizations to also get administrative buy-in as to why this is important to, to move to this phase of archival preservation, web preservation. So, that. I'm so sorry, very quick follow-up. Sure. Just thinking about the urgency and then your mention of kind of timely and ephemeral archives, if you had like a magic wand and you could get some set of content or something archived tomorrow forever, is there anything that comes to mind? Anything that's like so hard to archive or anything that you like really worry about? I know that's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> is that for both of us? Either of you, yeah. Okay, so my answer would be black Twitter because from black twitter you can get pretty much everything else everything else is probably hyperlinked from there so it, it really is the source of um a source um of kind of this online conversation that's been happening for you know since what 2006 7 um whenever twitter was started um and now that is being threatened every day with twitter's new leadership, if we can call it leadership. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that would be it, because I think it, it is a, a effective way to see how people are communicating with each other, but then also many of the other resources and creations and, um, yeah, artworks and footage and every, like, I feel like it will be a good sampling of everything else. <laughs> So my question is for both of you. Also, thank you so much for both presentations. It's really, really great. Um, could you? It's more of a, a general open question, uh, which is essentially a, a little bit also terminally online, which is uh, how could you both of you reflect on the 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 ways in which the projects interact with, say, the emergence of say uh, web adjacent 
uh, black culture, for example, um, HIO creators, like independent game creators who publish extensively through browser-based platforms or Oculus Quest uh, developers or other game, like Unity developers, musicians on SoundCloud, things like that within that, within that context. Um, yeah, this is not a direct question. I'm just curious as to how that, how those complexities uh, are accommodated or, or present challenges in general for the projects. I think that's something that we are hoping to explore. Um, because when I think about sort of like content creation in, in the digital space and all the, the possibilities, um, one of the first ways that I'd started thinking about it was when I was working on community webs and understanding the sort of the NIARC project of artists and then working with our um, curator for the arts and her talking about like, her building artist files, but now they're sort of, it's hard to do because a lot of the content is being created in the digital space. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I hope that as we move through this project with the Web Archiving School, that these are sort of questions that we can actually present in the training for folks to start thinking about um, it, because one of the things about Black culture is that we have never been sort of like this text-based community how our history is passed down or like so there's that so we're we can try to think about decentering always the the sort of printed and so how do we provide um support for the 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 visual and the other kind of content creation do you have any thoughts yeah um i think that's a wonderful question i think um that is sort of where the the responsibility is expanded to creators themselves um, and why it's important to also uh, educate and help provide creators with resources to be thinking about documenting themselves outside of the platforms that they may use, reminding people, which is uh, some work that we do with Documenting the Now, of always reminding people that we do not own these platforms. Um, and when it comes to Black communities, we often have not owned the the technologies or the tools that we've used to um, sort of break and disorder and create in all these ways. And so this is nothing new, but technology sort of makes us uh, forget that, that like it's so easy for someone to just turn it off, delete it, erase you from the platform, and then you don't have any backups of it. Um, and so I think that that sort of highlights the need to not only educate um, and provide institutions with resources and training, but also always be in conversation with creators to be doing this work themselves and reminding them that most of these platforms, I don't know about SoundCloud, but a lot of platforms have ways for you to download you know, your archive. And you may not even know how to use it once you download it. Sometimes I look at the platform downloads and I'm like, I don't know how to use this right now, but maybe one day I'll figure it out. But at least I know I downloaded it one time and like it's there or I'll download it every six months. But just reminding them that they have to be active in their documentation in a way that we maybe didn't have to be so active in it before because it was paper. And like if you put the paper in the corner, you know, it's going to be there unless, you know, natural disaster happens. But if you put it in the cloud, you don't always know it's going to be there unless you check on it. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that that's sort of where the work uh, sort of splits into those two areas. I keep thinking about the recruitment piece of it. And not we talked yesterday about recruitment and IAPC as members, but also recruitment within our organizations as we're posting jobs, as I often do. <laughs> and I would love to see a more diverse pool coming in, but we're not getting people applying, and I'm wondering, are there ways that we can connect with your communities through your projects to spread the word about our jobs? Are they not written in a way that are appealing to people? Um, a lot of our jobs don't have the curatorial side, so it's it's more on the technical program side, um, so you wouldn't be selecting content, but I am wondering if there are ways that you could suggest our organizations could do better reaching out to the broader community. I, I actually think it it's 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 a multi approach because besides the key, I don't know very many diverse uh, 
black archivist, web archivist. And that's the truth. And so that was one of my questions is like, this is not skills necessarily that we're learning in LIS programs, but if this is something that you're teaching or training on site and at, at, at your institutions, then think about who is actually a part of your institution and, and bring someone else that might have an interest um, that might be a person of color because that's that's been the sort of the pathway um, prior. And so maybe that's a way in which you can do that. But hopefully, um, as we start this web training program, and this will be for folks that are at Black collecting institutions, but also memory workers, Black memory workers who are interested in this process, uh, this, this practice, um, but have not found ways, entryways into it. Hopefully, after they experience this training and get some some skills built, that they could be a viable candidate. So stay connected to the project. One of the things that I think that's important for you all that are at sort of well situated, resourced organizations is to think about how you actually work through your organizations to impact change. It might not necessarily be that you hire somebody, but um, there could be internship opportunities and things like that, um, that that you really want to consider. Because one of the things that I think that is important for web archiving is that this is an opportunity to do something different. We don't have to create the same collections that we have that are paper-based, right? How can we figure out ways to use web archiving to create and disrupt some of the ways that we've done some disservice in terms of the paper traditional archive and thinking about um, this is an opportunity to not just do the same thing we've done in the past. So from the practice, from who gets to do it, to the tools and all of those things. So um, that's my hope is that we start to really think about um, how we can really use web archiving to disrupt and be more inclusive in, in using this tool and, and how to do that is actually to start bringing more folks to the table who think differently, have different lived experiences to break, to create better tools, to create um, better practices, um, because this, to me, this is the future, so. And I'll just add um, that I learned in, in on the job um, at where I worked uh, prior to uh, the Schomburg Center at Barnard College. Um, and so in sort of creating web archives through Archive-It about um, student organizations. And so I think something really simple to include on job applications is willingness to train. Um, because a lot of people don't, I didn't learn it. There was, it wasn't an option in my library program. And so, um, yeah, I, and I think I, I wasn't even perfect after leaving Barnard. I learned a lot through the job at Schomburg and through um, archive at training and, and reaching out to like different colleagues. And I went to visit other, um, like to uh, New York University and to the Frick Museum to like watch them do their own web archiving programs. Um, and that's, uh, NYU is where I learned about using Airtable. And so I think um, just adding willingness to train would invite a lot of students to, to, or a lot of people to come in um, knowing that they don't have to be perfect at it. Um, and then I think another consideration is thinking about the like diversity and inclusion in the institution as a whole. So even though people may want to work in, in web archiving, they may not see the institution as nice and cozy and diverse and maybe the, the institution has a reputation. And so that may involve some like outreach um, to, you know, maybe convince people that the web archiving program is a safer space within the institution if that's the case. But if that's not the truth, don't tell people that. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't bring us in there if it's not a safe space. Um, so working towards a safer, diverse space in general will also bring more uh, uh, diverse communities into these spaces. But yeah, always a willingness to, to train and, and reminding people that they don't have to be perfect at it to get the job. Lord knows I was not perfect. I just want to shout out Jefferson Bailey. Internet Archive. I mean, this is, Community Web is a model in a way, and I think people are ready for us to get out, sorry. It's a model. I mean, I would not be standing here talking about web archiving if it had not been for that particular program. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>